I work at UCL at the Cruciform building, which is that Harry Potter looking building right in front of the main building of UCL. And, um, and um, uh, before I even start, I should say that uh, this work was funded by the Wellcome Trust and by the Simon Foundation. And I share the lab with Kenneth Harris, who I think has already given a talk in this series uh, about imaging 10,000 neurons and um, showing the, the properties of the visual representation in, in, in visual cortex. So today I'll tell you a little bit of a, a few studies that we're doing and that we've done. Um, and the general question that we're addressing is um, how does the brain uh, make decisions that are uh, informed by uh, sensory input, in this case vision, and uh, um, considerations of value, and how does it learn from its, um, from its experiences, okay? So say that you're picking blackberries or brambles in, in British English, um, um, you would prob you know that the darker ones are the best ones. So given this uh, selection, you'd want to choose uh, this one up here um, and, and eat it. Uh, but suppose that you don't have this nice dark juicy one you need to choose what you think is the best one you try it you evaluate the outcome and you decide what to do next which one should i get next um, and so we would like to know how this works and if you go look at a textbook this is a famous textbook in neuroscience um, there is the understanding that um, there are you can break this into different processes processing images making a decision about which of the brambles is a good one, moving the body appropriately, and then processing the outcome and learning something from it, and so that the next time you do a better job. And this is probably a good way to think about it. I'm not saying it's a bad way to think about it, but, but what's implicit in the, in the textbook is that this is done um, in different brain regions. So different brain regions are specialized for processing imaging, for making decisions, for moving the body, for processing the outcome. And this sometimes is explicitly stated, and sometimes it's implicit, like in the organization of the chapters of books. I'm sure that many of you have a more sophisticated view of brain function, um, but this is kind of the view that is given to you by textbooks. And this view is supported if you uh, look at the kind of um, um, you know, analyses that neuroscientists uh, often do. Um, in, for example, if you use fMRI for functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you put people in a scanner, um, uh, if you do that, you obtain images that look like this. This is a very fun website called neurosynth.org, uh, where you can type in some keywords. And I typed in some keywords that are not exactly the same ones that appear here, but I think I typed vision and I obtained the, these red spots or I typed um, decision-making and I obtained these other red spots. Anyway, this is an aggregator of lots of uh, scientific papers using fMRI where the, and in these papers say the subject is viewing visual images and then they, they show you the average activity in the brain, of the average brain when people see visual images and you have this image on the left and so on. And so this gives you the, the idea that, um, um, this, you know, every process is localized in the brain. But the fact is that these procedures that we're looking at here um, throw away any activity that is global so that to show you, you know, hot spots. So it's possible that there are things that are much more global than this. And it's also possible that there are things going on at the level of individual neurons, which are completely lost in this um, measurement of mass activity. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move on and now tell you how we study this in the lab. In the lab, we study this uh, with mice. Um, and our mice perform decisions, visual decisions, based on what they see. And to give you an idea of what our setup looks like, um, imagine, so these things that appear to be transparent, in reality are not transparent, they're screens. And to give you an idea of the size, each of them is an iPad screen, okay? Which is a waste of money because the mouse is not touching them. Uh, it, we're just using them as visual displays, um, and but they don't cost that much. And so there are three iPad screens around the mouse. The mouse is lying on this cylinder. By the way, there's no mouse in this picture, so don't think that you're hallucinating. Um, uh, there's a mouse in, in our experiment lying here with the tail dangling here, and the two front paws are on this wheel. And that, think of it as a steering wheel, okay, as if the mouse was driving. Now mice have their eyes to the side of the head 
uh, and which is typical of prey, by the way, and they see 270 degrees around them. This is why we put screens all around them, okay? Um, and the task of the mouse is to tell us what it sees on the screen. And on the screen, there are generally two stimuli, one on the left screen and one on the right screen. And these are called Gabor images, whatever, the gratings, black and white bars. And uh, one of them has a higher contrast than the other. Contrast is 100% uh, when black is blackest and white is whitest. Um, and so, and the mouse needs to tell us which one has higher contrast by turning the wheel. And so in this case, the left one has higher contrast. So the mouse turns the wheel this way and therefore, and in doing that, it moves the actual stimulus to the center. It's as if the mouse was orienting its head towards the stimulus of higher um, contrast. But in reality, the head is fixed and you will see why, because when we want to know exactly where the eyes are and we want to have access to the brain and we don't want the brain to move. So this is the main task. If the higher contrast stimulus is on the left, choose left. If the higher contrast stimulus is on the right, choose right. If there is absolutely nothing on the screen, hold the wheel, don't move. We call that a no-go, okay? And so you can think of this as in the, in the Blackberry example. If the darkest Blackberry is on the left, pick the left one. If the darkest Blackberry is on the right, pick the right one. If there are no good Blackberries, hold, don't pick anything, okay? Um, and um, mice get really, really good at this. But now I need somebody who's not Sarah to say that you're still hearing me because I'm getting zero feedback. Yeah. yeah. Yes, fantastic, great. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, okay, fantastic. So, um, so now, just to show you the mice get really good at this. This is, these are called psychometric curves. Uh, um, psychometric is a word that was invented in the late 1800s by Gustav Fechner. Um, and so this measures the performance of the mouse as a function of various stimulus conditions. In this case, I'm just showing you the responses of the mouse when there, are, there is either one stimulus on the left or one stimulus on the right to make things simpler. And negative contrast means the, the contrast of the stimulus on the left and positive contrast means the contrast of the stimulus on the right. So basically you can see this mouse is practically, and this is common by the way, this mouse is practically perfect. When there's high contrast on the left, the mouse almost 100% of the times tells us that it's on the left. When there's high contrast on the right, the mouse almost 100% of the time tells us there's something on the right. When there's nothing at all on the screen, which is this condition zero, the mouse, you know, 75% of the time holds the wheel, great. But also, and beautifully, the mouse makes a bunch of mistakes. For example, these are all, these points that are here, uh, are all points where the mouse should have um, moved the wheel, but instead the mouse chose to hold the wheel. And, and in doing that, and, and that was a mistake. And this is very, and, and also, you know, these points here contain a number of mistakes, right? These are all cases where the mouse should have chosen the, the right word stimulus, but it chose maybe a few times the left one or some no-goes. Um, and because this stimulus was hard to see, it was low contrast. And these mistakes are fundamental for our ability to understand decision-making because the physical reality is exactly the same in front of the mouse, but the mouse comes up with a different decision. And therefore, by understanding what's happening in the brain when the mouse is making these mistakes, we, try, we can try to understand the basis of decision making. Okay, so now I'm going to show you what happens in the brain at a very broad scale, and I'm, I'm not going to expect you to uh, make sense of it unless you're spectacular at um, pattern recognition, okay? So this is the mouse doing the task, and I hope you see on your screens um, some blue and red spots, um, which, I'm not gonna ask you to make sense of them because you don't even know what parts of the brain I'm showing you. But it's just to show you that there's massive bilateral activity. So left is the left part of the brain, right is the right part of the brain. It's spectacularly bilateral, it's very rich, and it goes on also when the mouse does seemingly nothing. On the left, you can see the mouse turning the wheel and licking and whisking and, and, and so on. Okay, so now to help you make a sense a little bit of this, I don't know how many of you um, know anything about brains. Um, I hope some of you do some, but you don't need to know much. Uh, so just to help you now start to, to understand a little more, um, we're looking at the dorsal cortex of the mouse. The, the cerebral cortex in a human is super convoluted, but in a mouse it's smooth, which helps a lot. And, um, and at, at the back of the lower part is the visual part of the, of the cortex, the primary visual cortex and a bunch of secondary visual areas. And in the front, you have frontal cortex, 
in red, which is called secondary motor for historical reasons. And you have primary motor cortex in purple. Still, I don't think you'll be able to understand this movie of activity without me sim you know, simplifying it further or at least you know, analyzing the data a little bit, which is what I do in the next slide. So here you can start to make sense of what happens on average in the cortex when the stimulus comes up. This is a case where there's a high contrast stimulus on the left side of the screen and at time zero, nothing happens. Then about you know, 50 milliseconds later, you start seeing some activation in primary visual cortex. Sometime later, you start seeing activation in secondary visual cortex, this region called AL, this AL. Sometimes later, you see activation in frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex uh, here. And then if there is an explosion of activity all over the brain, basically, all over the court when the mouse is about to turn the wheel. By the way, the entire talk here is about what happens before the mouse turns the wheel, OK? And, and this explosion of activity is there only if the mouse does turn the wheel. If the mouse doesn't turn the wheel is what happens down here, okay? So based on this activity, by the way, this is, this, this, these responses are obtained by using a technique called white field imaging, which I can get into if you want, but um, it gives you every pixel here is probably a blurred activity of you know, tens of thousands of neurons. Um, with a lot of optical scatter. So this is not a precise technique to, to tell you what each neuron is doing, but it's pretty precise to tell you what each brain region, brain area, cortical area is doing. So as you might imagine, you can use this data to decode various attributes of the task. Um, and so I'm going to now use a very simple decoder. I think it's a linear decoder, but you know, it doesn't really matter which decoder you use. Um, by looking at the cortex, you can do a spectacular job at distinguishing whether there was a stimulus on or not, which is shown on the top, at predicting whether the mouse is going to move or not move, which is shown in the middle. But you do a horrible job at predicting whether the mouse is going to turn left or turn right, uh, which is shown at the bottom, OK? So uh, here, you, uh, the different columns are different moments in time. And so if you want to decode whether there was a stimulus or not on the left, all you have to do is look at the right visual cortex. Makes sense, right? The right visual cortex looks at the left stimuli. Um, and if you look at all these dark pixels um, in the right visual cortex, you'll do a fantastic job at decoding whether or not there was a stimulus on the left. Fine. Also prefrontal cortex, by the way, you do a good job up here. Uh, and from ev pretty much every pixel on the cortex, you can predict whether uh, the mouse is about to move or not. I mean, these pixels here on the sides are uh, light because we have poor imaging there. And so our statistical value is, values are bad. Um, and, but we do a horrible job at predicting, actually we do a chance, we are a chance at predicting whether the mouse is going to turn left or right. Now, and I'll explain, I'll go into the possible reasons for that. Now, how is it that the entire cortex seems to code movement that seems weird. I mean, the primary, the motor regions of the cortex are here. Um, why is the entire cortex telling us about whether the mouse is going to move or not? So let's see what parts of this activation are causal, that is necessary for the task, and what parts are not. So to do that, we're going to do an experiment in which we're going to go over different spots of the cortex and inactivate them with a laser. I'm not going to get into the details of that is, how that is done, but it's done with random access, OK? So the mouse is doing its normal task, and randomly, uh, in a minority of trials, um, we inactivate different parts of the cortex, OK? And so this is a summary of the results, shown for the case in which the mouse is looking at two identical stimuli on the left and on the right, OK? So it's an ambiguous situation. And here, we're going to bias the mouse towards choosing the left or choosing the right by inactivating various parts. And now the size of the dot tells you um, the size of the effect and the color tells you what the effect was. And so basically, if you inactivate the right visual cortex, you make the animal less able to see stimuli on the left and therefore you increase the number of choices towards the right, which is red. And so this is true in, in visual cortex, secondary, primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and um, premotor cortex on the right. Opposite situation on the left. But as you can see, inactivating the, this, these motor regions did absolutely nothing. 
In reality, actually, it slowed down the movement a little bit, but it did nothing to the choice. Okay, so now uh, we have the following situation. The um, remember the decoding results uh, told us that we were very good at decoding whether a stimulus was present or not. And here I'm comparing the decoding results that I already showed you with the inactivation results. And you can see that they're very similar. So both inactivation and decoding are telling us that sensory signals about whether the stimulus is present or not are super strong in visual cortex and in prefrontal cortex. Great. But now let's compare, and, and actually they're linearly related. So the more a pixel contains information about a stimulus being present, the more inactivating that pixel in cortex deteriorates the behavior of the mouse. Great. Whereas this looks very different, right? So on the right, you have the, our ability to decode whether the mouse is going to turn left, whether the mouse is going to move the wheel or not. And it, it doesn't look at all like the results of inactivation. So basically, there's zero relationship between um, our ability to decode whether the mouse is going to go or not go and our, our interfering with the cortex. So the, the result, what, what this means is that this massive activation that precedes the movement is not causal. It's, it's as if it was a corollary discharge, as if it was a, a signal that is broadcast to the brain. Hey, uh, we're about to move, um, but it's not necessary for the movement. Okay, so I'm going to now tell you a bunch of questions that arise from these results, and I'm going to go into answering them uh, later. Um, but this would be a good time to first pause and see if you have any questions about this part. Okay, uh, I'm going to now see, say, what kind of questions arise from this. First uh, question is, where are the choices made? Where in the brain do you choose whether to turn the wheel left or right? You'll remember that we were completely unable to decode choice from this dorsal cortex of the mouse. Um, we were unable to predict whether the mouse is gonna turn left or right by using this method called wide field imaging. And also, why are some regions active but not causal? This seems weird. Um, and uh, what happens in individual neurons? This technique of wide field imaging is very coarse, as I told you. And what happens below the cortex in the rest of the brain? So now to address this question, uh, we turn to a new technique. Um, well, we could have used good old electrodes, but that would have been very laborious. So we use this new technology called neuropixels. And these neuropixels probes uh, are shown here. This by the way, well, the first time I saw this image, I didn't realize that this was a thumb of a person. So in case any of you had not realized it, now you know it. And once you know it, you'll never unknow it. Uh, this is the thumb, this is the index, and so on. And the probe is here, and it's one centimeter long, which is bigger than a mouse brain, so that's fine. And, it, and it's filled with a thousand recording sites. Um, and the, the, this is a chip, which is about one centimeter in size, and the chip does everything. It amplifies the activity of those recording sites, um, because the signal that neurons make um, is a few microvolt when you record extracellularly outside the neuron. So you need to amplify it a lot. And then it, this chip also digitizes the signal. So what comes out is entirely digital and can go straight into a laptop, basically. Meaning you don't really need a lab anymore to, to record from hundreds of neurons in the brain. And to give you an idea of how cool this technology is, um, this is a little history of recording technology over the last 70 years. Um, and um, in the early 1950s, people were very bright, you know, proud and understandably so, to have one recording electrode, one metal thing, surrounded by glass for insulation, except at the tip. And this, and so this is a 1953 Barlow Levick electrode. And this, these single uh, electrodes, are what gave us most of neuroscience, okay? Um, and then innovations were the tetrode here, which was four electrodes right next to each other, the 16-channel probe, and the neuropixels probe is up here at, a, at um, sorry, up here at about a thousand um, recording sites per shank. The shank is actually the probe, the, 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 the thing you put in the brain. And the probe is super narrow. It's only 70 microns wide. Those of you who have hair, many of you, if you have dark hair, um, and uh, they're going to be wider than 70 microns. And, um, and the other dimension is 20 microns, which is super fine. Anyway, once you have these electrodes, you can do 
recordings that were unthinkable fairly recently, okay? Um, so here's a double recording with one electrode more in the back of the mouse brain and one more in the front. And, um, and the, the, the one in the back is going through various regions of the brain called visual cortex, hippocampus, thalamus. The one in the front is going through other regions called motor cortex and striatum. And, you know, each of these electrodes is recording from hundreds of neurons. And just to give you an idea, I'm pretty old, okay, but still, I'm not like ancient, and my PhD thesis, my entire PhD thesis, was about 70 neurons. And in this recording that lasted, you know, an hour, um, there's like 800 neurons. Okay, this gives you an idea of, of what's happening in the field. And out of them, you can then use some pretty cool um, data analysis technique to extract the activity of individual neurons, which is shown here by colors. Each dot is the spike of a neuron, the, the electrical activity of a neuron, and, and in, on the x-axis is time. And so basically, you're listening to the orchestra of hundreds and hundreds of neurons firing together uh, while the mouse is doing any task or anything, okay, sleeping or doing a task or whatever. Okay, so we're going to use this technique now to understand what, are my, what happens in the brain of the mouse while the mouse is doing this task of turning the wheel. And so um, we, Nick Steinmetz, who was a postdoc in the lab, inserted one or two or sometimes three of these probes at the same time in mice, while the mice were, in a mouse, while the mouse was doing the task. So you're now looking at 10 mice, and all the electrodes are always on the left side of the brain, the left hemisphere. And, um, and so you have, you know, a, a large number of recordings. And in total, we recorded from 30,000 neurons, which is something that would have been completely a joke if somebody had told me, one day you write a paper with 30,000 neurons, I would have laughed, okay? And so, and, and, and we did this 30,000 neurons from 42 brain regions. Now, each acronym here is a different brain region, and you don't have to know what they mean, okay? I didn't know many of them by the time we wrote this paper, and I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of some crucial ones, but don't worry that you don't know these acronyms. By the way, the acronym tells you the name of the brain region, and the number tells you how many neurons we happen to have from that brain region, okay? So let me just tell you a few crucial ones. This blue stuff up here, which is also here, is the visual cortex that you've already seen from the top, but now you can see it from the side. Um, up here is uh, prefrontal cortex, called secondary motor here, which is in brown, and now you're seeing it from the side. And there are some, some funny regions that um, one might not think are so interesting, but they're really interesting. This one called ZI in gray. Uh, ZI stands for zona inserta. Does anybody want to venture the meaning of zona inserta? No, nobody really knows. So, so, so something uncertain. Exactly, it means <laughs> uncertain zone. Um, but as I will show, and I actually, to be honest, I did not even know that this area existed because I had studied it in neuroanatomy in 1990 and I had forgotten. And as you will see, this is the region where we find the highest number of neurons that make choices. So it's as if uh, that was the most certain zone of the mouse. Uh, but that number is 6%, which is very low. I'm going ahead here. And then there's other regions, so the midbrain reticular nucleus, et cetera. So this is called the midbrain here. And this one in here is called the forebrain. All right. So. I'm going to now show you, out of these 30,000 neurons, I'm going to show you six neurons, just to give you a very broad idea of the kind of activity that we see. But these six neurons are not random. They're selected because they give different responses when the animal chooses left versus choosing right. And this will allow me to give you an idea of what kind of analysis we do on these neurons, okay? So here are the six neurons. And let's look at the first one. That, that, that neuron is in primary visual cortex, which as you can imagine, is devoted to vision. Okay, so that neuron gives a strong response in orange when the stimulus is on the opposite side, which is great, it's exactly what it should do, and gives a tiny response when the stimulus, is, when, sorry, not the stimulus, the choice, uh, when the choice is on the uh, opposite side. Okay, so to, to understand these responses, we have, uh, we fit them with a model and it's a generalized linear model. It's, it's very simple. And 
it has three terms. One is a visual term. Um, so every neuron is allowed uh, a response um, based on what's on the screen, okay? At the time of the stimulus. One is an action term. Every neuron is allowed a response uh, for impending action, um, and that's aligned to the time of the actual action. And then there's a choice term, which is every neuron is allowed to distinguish the, the action left minus action right. By the way, this task doesn't is not this, this task is about choices that are immediately um, uh, enforced or you know executed, right? So I, if I decide now I'm going to sell my house, or I, I, nothing physical is going to happen, right, for the next two months, and then in two months maybe I'll phone a, a realtor, but but the choices here are immediately executed. So we're, we're not able to distinguish the abstract making of a choice to the, to the planning of a movement to the left. But that's still an interesting question. Where do you plan based on the stimulus you've just seen, whether you're gonna move left or right? Okay, so this model that, as I told you, has three components, vision, action, and choice. And that's indicated by the full curves. Okay, and the full curves, not the dashed ones, do a pretty good job at predicting the activity of, the new, of these six neurons, fine. But now the question is, what happens if I take away one of these terms? What happens if I take away vision? What happens if I take away action? What happens if I take away choice? And here I'm showing how, what this model does when I take away choice. So I don't allow the model to distinguish choices to the left and choices to the right. For this neuron in primary visual cortex, Taking away choice does nothing to the model. It's fine. This neuron, therefore, we say this neuron is not encoding choice. The reason why this neuron fires more for choices to the right versus choices to the left is that there were more visual stimulus on the right, and this neuron is visual, okay? And uh, maybe it has a little bit of action coding, so there is a bit of a bump, no matter whether the action is to the left or to the right, but there's no choice coding in this neuron, okay? But there, as you can imagine, there's a lot of visual coding. Uh, but now I'll take this neuron here in midbrain reticular nucleus. It's this one where the mouse is. Here there's a strong positive response for choices to the right, a strong, uh, a weak negative response for choices to the left. But if we take away this choice term, we do a horrible job. Therefore, we say this neuron encodes choice. Okay, I think you are the kind of crowd that totally got this. But if there's anything I can say, help, you know, help me help you. This is the technique that we use to decide whether a neuron encodes vision, action, and choice. Okay, um, so now we can ask, well, where are the neurons that encode vision, okay? And we find them in pretty much the place where the textbooks would tell us that they should be, in the visual system, okay? And so here's the percentages. 30% of neurons in primary visual cortex uh, respond to the stimulus coming on, um, just, just like the textbook tells you. Um, by the way, we did aim the electrodes for primary visual cortex to hit the place that is looking at the visual stimulus because there's an retinotopy organization. If you look at it, the wrong part of visual cortex, they might be looking at a different part of the visual field where the stimulus doesn't come up. Um, and also you can see a lot of higher um, visual areas firing, and you can see also responses in other brain regions, such as the superior colliculus, which is known to be visual. So it's all good. It's exactly what you would have expected, okay? So, uh, and actually, if you look at the view from the top of the regions that are encoding visual stimuli, it looks very much like the view that we saw when we were decoding the white field imaging, right? Um, there's encoding in, of vision in, um, uh, in the visual areas of the cortex and in prefrontal cortex and in a bunch of regions below the cortex. Fine. So this is just like the textbook says. This is really not what the textbook says. Uh, we can decode, uh, we, we find neurons encoding action uh, all over the brain in every single region that we recorded from, um, which is really not what the textbook says. The textbook says that motor actions are encoded in motor regions of the brain. And in particular, we saw uh, strong activations uh, in these regions here, which are regions of the midbrain, but everywhere else as well, okay? And this actually, again, agrees with the wide field imaging that we had done from the top of the brain. You can see that the entire cortex contains signals about impending movement, and we were able to decode them from imaging. So again, we agree. 
And now let's look at where there are choice signals. So one thing to keep in mind is that these, um, this panel goes up to 30%, this y-axis. I'm gonna replot those two. These are the neurons encoding contralateral visual stimuli, neurons encoding movement. Now look at the neurons encoding choice. Um, the scale now goes to 10%. There are barely any neuron encoding choice out of this, all these brain regions. The, the winner is zona inserta with 6% of neurons encoding choice, okay? So there's now, um, choice is, seems to be encoded by a very distributed network, which is over a bunch of uh, brain regions shown here in red, uh, and by very few neurons in, that, in those regions. So, um, and, oh, okay, let me tell you one more thing. Let's zoom in into this uh, set of regions where we found choice-selected neurons. Um, and so one more thing that I wanna tell you is that in these regions shown in yellow, uh, we found a few neurons that vote for left and a few neurons that vote for right. Um, but in the uh, midbrain, which are these regions shown in red, we only found neurons that vote for the contralateral because we recorded from the left hemisphere, all the neurons voted for right. Okay, they were right-wing neurons. Um, and so in the fact that here in prefrontal cortex, you have very rare neurons encoding choice, but half of them vote for left and half of them vote for right and they're sitting right next to each other might be the explanation why we were unable to decode choice from white field imaging because white field imaging blurs the activity of tens of thousands if not more of neurons um, and so we, these signals would have been washed out okay so now you may wonder is there a bossy region that actually tells the rest of the brain how it's going to be um, and so we don't it's hard to for us to answer that question because our recordings, we didn't do inactivations below the cortex, and so it's hard to tell. But there's one thing that we could look at, which is, is there one region where the choice develops earlier in time? We have exquisite um, temporal resolution with these, with these recordings. And so now what we're going to do is see whether we can decode choice earlier from, say, frontal cortex or from the midbrain or from the caudiputamen, which is another region. And the answer is no. Um, we obviously we do a very good job of predicting choice at time zero, which is the time of the movement. We do a terrible job 150 milliseconds before, and but, but our ability to predict choice seems to grow um, jointly when we decode from these different brain regions. So at least based on the data that we have, it doesn't look like one of these brain regions leads the others in making the choice. So. Summary up to here is that neurons selected for choice are rare and lie mostly in midbrain, striatum, and frontal cortex. Those in midbrain are activated only for contralateral choices and suppressed for ipsilateral. And this may suggest a competitive midbrain circuit for adjudicating choice. And this is illustrated here. Um, Basically, the idea is that when a stim visual stimulus, you know, this is very brainy though. I think I'm gonna skip this slide. If you're interested, I'll come back to it. But this is really about a model of how the brain does this, what kind of circuits underlie it. And I'm not sure this is central to your, to your interest. So let me summarize um, this part of the talk because I wanna then get to the reinforcement learning part. Um, by the way, I got a message that my connection is unstable. So if you have trouble hearing me, please tell me in some, in some way. Um, so let's summarize this part of the talk. We have found that vision engages neurons in the classical visual pathway, just like the you know, textbook says. We have found the neurons selected for choice instead are rare and distributed. The, the highest percentage was 6% of them in zona inserta, which is not a high percentage. And we have found that action drives 60% of neurons nearly everywhere in the brain. Uh, but that doesn't mean that this is causal. It's simply that a signal is broadcast to the whole brain uh, before an action. By the way, this is true for a mouse. It's not necessarily true for a human, but there is one study in fMRI that says something similar that I can dig up if it's interesting to you. And so the first thing totally agrees with the textbook. That's exactly what a textbook would have told you, that there's parts of the brain involved in vision. Yep. The second is really not what the textbook would have said. I never read anything like that. But there's a distributed network of neurons here and there that encode choices. And the third one also is not what a textbook would have said. Textbooks tell you that actions are encoded in motor 
areas of the brain. Okay, so I have now, you know, maybe 10, 15 more minutes, and I want to switch to a different aspect, which is the learning of this task and the evaluation of outcomes. But this would be a good time to ask me questions about this part of the talk. Okay, now I need somebody to tell me whether I'm being spectacularly clear or spectacularly obscure. Um, yeah, I have a question. I'm just curious uh, how much of this is uh, similar for humans as for mice? Ah. Um, it's hard to tell because we rarely record from neurons in humans, okay? There are some papers like the Jennifer Aniston neurons and all that stuff um, from the temporal cortex of humans before it gets taken out because these are people who are having surgery for uh, epilepsy. Um, but we don't really know the activity of neurons uh, in the human. We know much more about non-human primates, uh, also known as monkeys. Um, and but we don't have recordings at this scale. So in monkeys, though, it does appear that choices are also encoded in a number of structures, not only the parietal cortex, but also um, the striatum, the colliculus, prefrontal cortex. So, so this is fairly consistent with what goes on in a monkey, I would say. But I don't know that in a monkey these action signals are broadcast so widely across the brain. I don't know if you were to record from the primary visual area of a monkey and the monkey is about to move its arm, would you see a signal about the arm movement in the primary visual area? Maybe not. Maybe it's, this is more specific of a mouse. I don't know. But there is one study in human that says that there are these movement signals that are all over. What's okay. the zona inserta in a human? Oh, it's totally there. It's the same name. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. So it's, not, oh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is all conserved. This, you know, the brain of a mammal is the brain of a mammal. Um, it's just that we have an astonishingly larger cor cerebral cortex, but all the brain regions I mentioned today are present in us, hopefully, all of us, hopefully. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next question. So after you pick the bramble, you want to evaluate what happens and some Rambles may be better than others, right? And you want to recalibrate your actions and keep on eating. So the task that I told you about doesn't really, you know, lend itself to considerations of value and reward. Um, because if, you, if the stimulus is on the left and you choose left, you're going to get a drop of juice. By the way, this, these mice are thirsty and they receive water as a reward, okay? And so if the, mouse, if the stimulus is on the left, the mouse goes left, it gets one drop. The stimulus is on the right, the mouse goes right, it gets one drop. And so we're not varying value. And so now let's, let's introduce a modification here. Let's make the right side more valuable or the left side more valuable. So what should happen to this curve? Okay, this curve is a psychometric curve. It indicates how many times the animal went to the right when there was a stimulus on the right or on the left. And you can see these mice were essentially perfect. When there was a high contrast stimulus on the right, by the way, I'm going to move now to a task in which there's only one stimulus on the screen, okay? Um, when, when, there was always a, when there was a stimulus on the right, the mouse went to the right. When there was a stimulus on the left, the mouse went on the left. And was, when there was nothing on the screen, the mouse guessed left versus right. We're, we're, we're going to take out the no-go condition, okay? So this, these mice were perfect, were really, really good. So what happens if one side is more valuable than the other? What should you do when there's zero contrast? Let's Bet imagine the, the right side. One. Sorry, go ahead, Rick. Bet on the value one, the most valuable one. Yeah, bet on it, right? So, so what, you what should you do? You should, if there's nothing on the screen, you should go on the higher value one, right? And, and, but if there's something on the screen and you can see it, you should totally do what the screen says because you will not get rewarded if you do the wrong thing, okay? So, so basically these curves should shift left and right depending on the value of the various options. And if you now go see what mice do, they do exactly that. If you make the right uh, option more valuable, you get more right choices 
um, and if you get make the left option more valuable, you get more left choices. Okay, so mice uh, adjust their behavior. So let's have a very simple model for what the mice might be doing. And this model is, um, um, uh, you know, you can imagine. I don't know if you know Q learning and values, but you can imagine a very very simple idea in which. Uh, the visual system tells the mouse the probability of a stimulus being on the left or on the right. So if the stimulus is totally obvious, say PR might be one and PL might be zero. If the stimulus is totally ambiguous, PL and PR might be 0.5, both of them, okay? And so, and imagine that the mouse has learned that it's in a block where um, left has a certain value and right has a certain value. So VL and VR are the values of the left choice and the right choice. And so what you should, what the mouse should do is simply multiply the probability that there is a stimulus on the left times the value of the left option um, and multiply the probability of the stimulus on the right times the value of the right option, come up with predicted values of the two actions, left and right, QL and QR, choose the maximum one, makes it and make its choice. Okay. So this seems like a, essentially the most minimal model you can have of this behavior, okay? I don't think you can come up with a simpler model. If you can, let me know. Um, and so, and this does a good job. It predicts the activity of the mouse. Uh, this is what's shown by the curves. Uh, but it can also do much more. So let's see how the mouse would learn the values, of VL and VR, of these two options. And to do that, obviously, we're going to use um, reinforcement learning. Uh, and so assume that when the mouse has made a choice, uh, the predicted value of that choice gets stored somewhere. We're going to call it QC, which is going to be identical to QL if the choice was L, or QR if the choice was R. Um, and then this number was going to get stored, and the mouse turns the wheel, gets a reward or not, that's the outcome, then computes a difference between what the outcome was uh, was it two drops, was it one drop, was it zero drops, and what the predicted value was, um, and computes the difference, and then has a learning rate, alpha, and updates either the left or the right value, depending on which choice it took. I imagine you've seen reinforcement learning models of this kind. Can somebody confirm where you, whether you have or not? Yep. Uh, okay. Alex. I guess I usually think about it at a different level of abstraction slightly, but yeah, it's essentially very similar. Okay, I, I imagine you have not seen the sensory part because what I'm showing here is basically the model you would use for a two-armed bandit task. Um, everything, everything. If, if you if you exclude the X and the PL and the PR and the visual stimulus, this is a classic reinforcement learning task for how you go to Las Vegas and play two slot machines and choose which slot machine to play, okay? Um, but now we have extended it by including a sensory uncertainty term. Okay, so once you, now, now this is a dynamic model that predicts what the choice is gonna be and then from the outcome updates the values. And remember, we, we divide the, tri the session in blocks. In some blocks, the left has more value, in some blocks, the right has more value. And, and so when you do that, you, and so here's the first block in which the right has higher value than the left has higher value than the right has higher value than the left has higher value. And as you do this, the mouse tends to make more, uh, less rightward choices, more rightward choices, less, more, and so on and so on. Um, and, uh, and our model, which is shown in purple, does a really, really good job, okay? Not only, but this model also predicts a really strange quirk of the data. Um, I don't know how, um, this might be too much detail for you, but it predicts a really strange quirk, which is that after a trial that was perceptually hard, the mouse learns more. And, and the reason, if you think about it, is that when there's a trial that is hard, uh, uh, like low contrast, PL and PR are going to be low, close to 0.5, right? And so the predictive value is going to be low. The mouse is going to think, yeah, I bet I'm not going to get rewarded. Uh, but if the actual reward comes, that leads to a lot of learning. And so this model predicts that after a hard trial, um, the mouse should learn more than after an easy trial. And that's actually exactly what happens. Uh, so these curves are how much the mouse shifts its behavior after uh, a, a rewarded trial on the right, a rewarded trial on the left, and the shift is largest after a difficult trial. 
And so this is a, another confirmation that this kind of reinforcement learning slash perceptual uncertainty model does a good job. Okay, all up to now, all we've done is fit a model to behavior. We haven't looked in the brain at all. So let me quickly tell you that for these two places, two values, predicted, va sorry, these two uh, internal variables of the model, uh, predicted value and prediction error, we can find precise correspondence in the brain. The beautiful thing is that these, if you fit the model to the behavior, you come up with these inferred uh, variables, latent variables, QC and delta for every trial. They're fully constrained by the behavior of the mouse. So now you, now you can put them aside and compare them to activity in, in different parts of the brain. And to, I could tell you about a long story, but I'm gonna make it short. Uh, this predicted value QC, we find it uh, encoded by neurons in the um, uh, prefrontal cortex and specifically in the prelimbic region of the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex in the mouse is a tiny little thingy. In a human, it's enormous, okay? So there is no one-to-one -one mapping between human cortical regions and mouse cortical regions, okay? Um, it would be impossible. Um, and but 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 the prelimbic cortex also exists in humans, but uh, and it's not but it's not there. Um, and we find that the activity of um, neurons in the in the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, in the, specifically in the prelimbic region, uh, grows linearly with the predicted value uh, of, of every trial. Okay. So what we can also do is inactivate those neurons and see how that affects behavior. And when we inactivate them. So let's imagine that we now inactivate this variable and we set it to zero. What do you think is going to happen to in this model if you set that variable to zero? Will you get more learning or less learning? You've, you've just made your mouse highly pessimistic, okay? It always thinks that things are gonna go terribly. What do you think is going to come? Rick, you had unmuted yourself. Yeah, more, more learning, I presume. Yeah, more learning, right? Because every outcome leads to a big delta in the model. Because the, if you were able to, to set QC to zero, it means that the mouse always expects to not get rewarded every time you, by the way, we do this in a few trials, not in the whole, you know, every trial, otherwise the mouse would give up. Um, but still, well, I'm not sure what the mouse would do actually. It would change the strategy for sure. Anyway, so the prediction is that you should get more learning when you, when, if you were able in the brain to set QC to zero. And that's exactly what we find. When we inactivate this region called PL, prelimbic cortex, we find that the curves shift to the left and to the right more than they would have. And so this is a fun situation in which you find that the, you, act, you make the behavior stronger by inactivating a, a brain region. Okay, so now let's move on to this prediction error. And here I'm just going to confirm what you read in textbooks, which is that prediction errors are encoded uh, by neuron, dopamine neurons in the, in the midbrain. Um, and I'm sure you read this somewhere already. And that's true also in the mouse. We image the, the midbrain neurons and we find that their activity grows linearly with the prediction error on a trial by trial basis. But what we can do in the mouse, which is also fun, is that we can activate or inactivate those neurons. And in fact, what we do is we, we activate or inactivate them while having exactly the same physical reward on the left and on the right. And so if we activate neurons, we should be mimicking what happens when you have one drop on one side and two drops on the other. And if you inactivate neurons, you should be mimicking what happens when you have one drop on one side and nothing on the other. Okay. And that's exactly what happens. This is what happens when we activate, and this is what happens when we inactivate. And so um, this was my last slide, uh, and I just want to summarize the second part of the talk. Where um, So in the first part of the talk, I went through all sorts of brain regions, and I told you where are the signals for vision, uh, action, and choice, but I said nothing about learning. Whereas now I'm telling you about um, you know, how you process the outcome, of, of the action and the fact that a very simple reinforcement learning model, once you marry it with the very simple model of sensation, um, uh, can predict some numbers, some, some latent variables 
um, which you might think of them as just mathematical abstractions, but they are actually really, really good predictions of what happens in brain regions and specifically in medial prefrontal cortex and in midbrain um, dopaminergic neurons. So this is it. I hope I didn't go too technical on you because I know you're not neuroscientists, many of you are not. Uh, but as you can see, the tools that we're using, you know, GLM fitting, reinforcement learning models, and this kind of thing, are the very kind of similar ideas that you would use in machine learning in many in many circumstances, and in and uh, in modeling the activity of um, um, you know automata and, and agents in in, um, in an environment. Okay, I'm done, and thank you so much for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Can I ask a question, uh, Matteo? Please. Um, uh, uh, yeah, amazing, amazing uh, data. I was just wondering, the um, those neurons encoding choice uh, and and learning seem to be in the overlapping areas, which is good because that makes sense. So, but the uh, there are some areas that are just yeah, I I didn't recognize. For, so, so which are the reckon areas that? don't seem to crop up in human experiments, maybe because we just haven't looked or maybe because they're too small. And, and what do you think of the significance of those areas is? That's a really good question. You know, usually people who do fMRI, and here, you know, Queen Square is the temple of fMRI in human, um, but tend, tendentially they stay, they keep, they stick to cortex. I mean, let's, let's go back. I'm sorry, I'm going to do something that I hate, which is to go back a million slides so sorry for that let's go back to the slides about the brain of the human yeah so as you can see most of the brain of a human is cerebral cortex okay the you know this pretty much everything that you're seeing is cerebral cortex this stuff here is is be, is below the cortex, and usually when people do studies of um, uh, of various activity, they try to stay to the cortex because then they can parcelate it and they know what they're looking at. But here you can see that if you look, go to neurosynth and you look at where the outcomes are processed, there's a lot there's an activation in. Um, by the way, they, uh, these are really volumes. I chose slices through them to to make it pretty picture, but, in, but this site will give you a volume. You can see activity in the medial prefrontal cortex, just like in the mouse, and lots of activity in midbrain, in regions, in dopaminergic neurons, and in striatum. So there are strong similarities. I've given such a long answer that I probably didn't answer exactly the question you asked. Well, I was just wondering where, where was different? Where, which of the bits that you didn't expect, given what we... Okay, so what, I, what I found... That, was highly unexpected is that um, you see this here, for example, where it says uh, make a decision. Um, if you look, search for neurosynth for parts of the brain, hotspots that light up, you find some hotspots, okay? But what we find is a much more distributed representation of choice uh, with neurons sprinkled here and there. And it's quite possible that it's the same thing in humans. And therefore, techniques such as fMRI, if that's true, are terrible at telling you what's happening. It's as if, it, it's as if you were trying to understand um, politics by simply knowing what parties are for. But people are different from parties. Um, so I don't know if this analogy works. And so I'm, sh I'm showing you here some ways in which people are just like their party and ways in which people are very different, they don't necessarily do what their party says. And so making decisions might be a much more distributed process than appears from these spots on brains. And when you move your body, actually, your entire brain might get, at least in a mouse for sure, a, a, a broadcast of the impending movement, maybe as a corollary discharge so that you can undo the sensory effects of it, or I don't know why, but th these are the surprises. Cool, thank you. I'm just curious uh, whether uh, uh, there are any uh, physical and evolutionary insights one might bring to these questions. For example, uh, maybe I would, maybe one would expect that this is different in a mouse just because the brain of a mouse is much smaller and uses less energy than a brain in a human does. 
and uh, whether that perspective kind of sheds any light on these issues. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. Um, it's possible that the brain of a primate is much more specialized. So it's possible that my visual cortex and your visual cortex really only do vision. Whereas in a mouse, we find all sorts of signals that are non-visual in, in, and so it's possible that things are much more segregated in a primate. But the techniques that we use to study what happens in primate brains, including humans, are all designed to throw away global signals and, and they're not ideal for finding sparse representations. So you, you spoke about evolution. So good, so let's think again. Let me go back to politics for a second. The, the, the political system in England makes it so that it's extraordinarily hard for a third party to appear, right? Or to really matter. Um, occasionally it does. So and imagine that evolution is a bit like that. It makes it really hard for a new brain region to appear. Well, what, what it might do is allow for a sprinkling of neurons in other brain region that might have more in common with each other than the brain, with the other neurons in their own brain region. So Brexit was a case like that where it wasn't like one party was for it and one party was against it. There was, the opinion was you know, going across, although in a, in, not in equal parts. But, and so it, there could be processes where this geographic organization doesn't quite work, doesn't quite tell you, tell you what's happening in the brain. And if there are processes like that, and I argue that choice making is one of them, these techniques that are based on large scale imaging are just not going to work. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I just want to tell you that you are super welcome to come visit us when this very strange moment is over. And uh, we have mice performing all sorts of tasks, including virtual reality navigation, all sorts of cool things. And as you saw, if you also saw Kenneth's talk, the technology has now gotten to a point where one can ask some really cool questions. And also the experiments have become very different so you can actually do spectacular experiments without really being able to do surgery or wanting to do stuff like that. Whereas it used to be that you had to do all the biology to be able to do these kind of things. So if you're, if you're interested, um, come talk to Kenneth and us. And we always, uh, we always enjoy showing the lab to people and talking about cool ideas. So thank you very much.